Bueno, pues me da mucho gusto eh, presentarles este el día de hoy a Lorán Lanar, que eh, es un miembro de nuestro instituto. Lorán obtuvo su doctorado en Grenoble eh, en 1998 y en el año 2000 eh, vino a trabajar al, a la entonces unidad académica del Instituto de Astronomía, o sea que este año cumple 24 años. Sí. sí. Eh, bueno, Lorán trabaja en, en distintos temas, trabaja en la formación de estrellas, trabaja en el nivel interestelar y es miembro de la colaboración del IHC para el estudio de las imágenes de los hoyos negros en la galaxia que nos va a hablar el día de hoy. Su especialidad es la interferometría de base muy larga y ha aplicado esta, esta, estos estudios de radioastronomía con todos estos bueno, él, él tiene muchísimo trabajo, es, él, es un investigador titular C, eh, nivel 3 del SMI y es FIDB, y tiene, eh, no sé, más de 200 artículos publicados, y, y como... <risa> Normalizado. Bueno, entonces ha recibido mucho reconocimiento por su trabajo, empezando por el, la distinción de la Universidad Nacional para Jóvenes Académicos cuando era joven. Es muy, es muy bueno eso porque, porque bueno, desde pequeño. Y ha recibido otros premios, pero en particular, como miembro del IHT, ha recibido premios, eh, ha sido recipiente de premios muy prestigiosos, como el premio Bruno Rossi de la Universidad Americana, American Astronomical Society, la medalla Albert Einstein y el premio Red Two 2020 en física fundamental, que son premios muy importantes. Bueno, además de toda su actividad de investigación, durante los últimos seis años, Lorán fue el coordinador del posgrado de Manuel. Y bueno, ya no les voy a proponer más con este currículum tan largo que les hice un resumen. No, 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 para la línea de las imágenes de este. Vale, gracias Susana. Mucho a, a todos, este, pero ya no soy coordinador del programa. Este, de lo que les voy a platicar hoy es eh, de las imágenes de, del IHT, del Event Horizon Telescope, y eh, seguramente que han visto por lo menos eh, algunas. En 2017 se publicó esta primera imagen, eh, bueno, en 2019, perdón, se publicó esta primera imagen, pero es una imagen basada en los datos tomados en la web de 2017. Y esta primera imagen de, de, de un agujero negro supermasivo que se ha publicado. Eh, y, y como pueden ver, tiene una estructura interesante. Tiene, eh, es, la, la región central de la imagen es más oscura y hay un anillo eh, más o menos circular que lo rodea con algunas variaciones eh, asimutales. Eh, y la, la, la meta de esta plática va a ser en particular explicar por qué es que se ve así la imagen. Eh, hace apenas un mes se publicó una nueva imagen, también de 87. Está tomada un año, casi exactamente un año después, en 2018. Y como, como pueden ver, se ve muy parecida a la imagen. También tiene esta zona oscura en el centro. También tiene un anillo eh, brillante alrededor. Tiene el mismo tamaño. Las dos imágenes aquí están en la misma escala angular. I should speak in English. Okay. You prefer? I would understand you, but <laughs> sorry, I switched to English. So the the, the 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 angular size here is the same. On, uh, the scale is the same. So the the, the size of the two images are, are the same. But what has changed a little bit is which part of the the ring is brightest. This has moved uh, the, the brightest. Part of the ring was here and here, and now it's, it's uh, more to the south. Um, but otherwise, the two images, if you didn't know which is which, yeah, they, they are very, very similar. Is the absolute brightness scale the same? Yes. 
Uh, and then this is uh, the image of Sajay Star that was published in uh, 2022, I think, um, taken also in 2017. And as you can see again, the, the size, the, the, the shape is the same. It's a, it's a ring surrounding a, a darker region. Uh, it, it turns out they're also more or less the same size, but that's fortuitous. It's because it turns out one black hole is 2,000 times uh, more massive, but also 2,000 times far farther. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is by chance, but what I, I want to point out is that the structure is the same. So it's always this dark region surrounded by a ring that has uh, azimuthal variations. So what I want to explain in this talk is why this happens, why this is always a structure that we see, and why this is good news, but also bad news. And the fact that it's bad news means that we should pay more attention to uh, Alice, she's not here, but uh, because as we are going to see what really enables us to say a lot more about black holes than these images are the polarimetry properties of the observations. Excuse me. Yes. In the center region, does it uh, go down to zero? No. There is a thing. That there, is a, there, is a, there is a contrast. Well, in this image, it's only about 10, in fact. It's about 10 times deeper. Uh, here, it's a bit farther, it's a bit deeper, but it does not go to zero. Uh, there is emission also at the center. And the emission from the center is well above the noise level? Yes. And we, this is, I'm going to explain why that's it. All right. So to understand that those images, we need just a little bit of general relativity. So as we know, uh, in general relativity, the way that gravitation is described is by saying that if you put a, a massive body somewhere in space, this produces a curvature of space-time in the surrounding that then defines how other bodies will move around that first body, right? And that curvature of space-time has the property that it not only affects uh, other massive bodies that it will in, in uh, Newtonian gravity, but it also affects light. And so if you have a light ray uh, that, that you, you observe here as an observer, this light ray doesn't follow a straight line. It has a massive body in the, in the way, as it would in, in Newtonian mechanics. It follows this curved path, right? And as we all know, uh, this is, in fact, one of the first predictions that Einstein made from his theory. And it was successfully, or not, I think there's some debate about this, but the story goes that it was successfully confirmed by uh, Eddington using a solar eclipse a few years after the prediction in 2019. Um, and, and black holes uh, are regions uh, of space time where that body is so massive that it somehow uh, uh, digs a hole into space time. So there's a point in, in, at the center where the, um, uh, the curvature is infinite. Right? So that there's a, this is the situation where the curvature of space-time is the most extreme. So of course, when you're looking at a black hole rather than the sun, these effects of curvature of space-time are going to be more extreme uh, and more immediately obvious. So this is really more or less all we are going to need of, of general relativity. But one of the important consequences is when you make images of uh, celestial bodies, uh, and there's a black hole along the way somehow. So, so because what ha what's happening then is, for instance, if you look, so this is my, my effect, it's a, it's a black hole with a migration disk and a check. But it could be anything, really, as long as there's a black hole somewhere. And, and we are here making an image, right? So it turns out that, for instance, if you look at that pixel of the image, then that light ray doesn't come from here as it would in, in Newtonian. Uh, gravity, it follows this path here. You see, I drew it with a, it's not a geodetic, I just drew it with a uh, PowerPoint. But that's the idea, right? That this light ray is, in the, the path that it follows is curved. And so the, the radiation that you're going to receive here in that pixel, to obtain it, you need to solve the uh, transfer equation for, for the, the applications of the, uh, of the EHT, the emission is fairly well described as optically thin, so we can describe, we can ignore this term, but we don't really have to, but it's easier if we do. So we have to solve this equation around this path, right? So if we ignore this term, what's going to happen is that the total intensity that we are going to receive is just going to be the integration of the source function 
over the light ray. It's just that this light ray is a very discovered. Okay. And so this is uh, this is the concept of ray tracing, right? We consider each pixel in the image and we integrate the uh, so we have a, a model, a physical model, which describes the source function everywhere, and we just integrate the source function around the light. This is called ray tracing. So to, to answer uh, very, very briefly with uh, your question, so of course these light rays that, that are directed exactly at the black hole, there is still some material along the line of sight that has a certain source function. So you're going to still see some emission in that pixel. Right? It, it just corresponds to the material between us and the black hole uh, along, along that path. So the, the, the central pixel is not going to be black. It's going to have some residual emission. Uh, <clears throat> that, that material is not necessarily uh, close to that black hole. Not necessarily, it's everything. In fact, in principle, you, go, you see the whole universe. So there, there are people who made these very cool images. I've actually tried, but I haven't succeeded. Well, you take your favorite picture from your last vacation on the beach, and you put a black hole in front, and you can make an image of what you would see. And what's interesting, in fact, is that yeah, if, if you zoom in close to the, the edge of the black hole, you can see multiple images because you have light rays that go one full turn, two full turn, three full turn, so you can see multiple images of your um, location in the same. Uh, sorry, one request. Would it be possible for you to point uh, using the, the mouse so that the people on, uh, on, on Zoom can see where you're pointing to? Thank you. Sure. OK, so let, let's look at this in a little bit more details about, about this issue. So, uh, again, I'm going to consider the situation where I'm afraid I can't. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's no mouse. Sorry, Enrique, I can't. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry. So, again, there, there's this black hole here. Uh, it has material around it. And I'm looking at the image that I'm going to see on the screen here, in which, uh, in spite of how it's drawn, is assumed to be infinitely far from the black. So each pixel on the image, and I assume if there's, uh, there's a cylindrical symmetry, so this is here. So each pixel on the, for each pixel on the image, I can look along the, the, the light ray that enters into that pixel, right, and see where it comes from. And what I want to show with this image is that there are two types of light rays. There are light rays like the green, that are all drawn in green here, that correspond to, to trajectories that go to infinity, right? So they are affected by the presence of the black hole, that they are not straight, seen from the observer, but they finish at infinity. And then there are the ones that are drawn in black here, which are light rays which uh, end up inside of the black hole, right? They, they, they follow the, the geodetics, but they end up inside of the black hole. So, of course, these light rays, the black light rays, are going to be dimmer in the image than the green light rays simply because they are long, they are shorter, right? I mean, they, they, you're only going to see what's along the ray between the screen and the black hole. Whereas these ones, the, the green ones, you're going to integrate over the entire ray, which goes to infinity. So this is what actually cre creates what is called a shadow, that dark region in the image is created by this effect because there is, there is a region at the center where those rays are going to be very short and are, you're only going to see what's between the, the black hole um, uh, horizon and screen, right? Whereas the other ones, you're going to see a much longer path and therefore a much, when you integrate the, um, the transfer equation, you're going to see more material, okay? And the, border between these two regions is shown as a, I don't know what color it is, but so I think it's not there yet, but you don't see it, there you are. So the, the, the border between these two regions is marked by this uh, blue circle here. So as you can see, all the green light rays, uh, neither of the green light rays cross that circle. They all at, at most, they get tangential to the circle, but they go away. Whereas all the green, the black light rays 
across that circle and definition inside of the glass. So that circle that is drawn here is the surface that separates light rays that go to infinity from light rays that don't go to infinity. Okay? And this is called, so you can you can ask, so what's happening on these light rays? Well, what, what if I if I consider a light ray that's exactly right, so it will be exactly tangential to that circle? Well, those light rays are going to stay in orbit around the black hole. You know? They are going to stay in circular, well, not in circular, they are going to stay in, in orbits on, on that sphere. Okay? So this is called the photon sphere. And it's the region that separates the, the this is the region that marks the size of the shadow. What's inside of the photon ring is the shadow, what's outside is outside of the shadow. Now, two things, or uh, one very important thing to mention here is, so there are three important or three important spheres for the black hole. One that we all know about is the event horizon, right? So this is the Schwarzschild radius, is given by this formula, and this is the, the region where if anything crosses that, that, that surface, it goes, it, it is lost forever, right? It's a kind of photon kind of scale. But then there's the photon sphere, which in Schwarzschild metric, but not in KR metric, is, uh, is one and a half times the size of the, of the Schwarzschild radius. And this is that region that marks the, the transition from light rays that go inside of the black hole and light rays that not. But then if you notice in the previous figure, so this is in the, in the um, in the rest frame of the of the black hole, this is that that, uh, that region, but the region as you see it on the screen is larger, right? That is the, the region that that sustains that uh, uh, photon sphere is not just that size here; it's the entire size marked by the red uh, line. So even though what we are seeing is the photon ring. What marks the transition from the shadow to the outside is the photon ring. The size of that region on the screen is larger than the photon ring, right? It's a it's a lens version of the photon ring. And that, that size is yet another um, number, which is about 2.6 2 times the Schwarzschild radius in, in the kernel. Uh, sorry, in, in Schwarzschild metric. So if you now look at the screen uh, in, in the image plane. So there's therefore a curve, which is called the critical curve, which in, in Schwarzschild metric is a circle with a size 2.6 times the size of the shadow uh, of the Schwarzschild radius. But in KR metric, that is with a, a black hole that has spin, it's a slightly more complicated curve that marks the difference between the shadow on the inside and the outside, which is not the shadow. Okay. This, this was worked out already by Balvin in 1973. And if you look at the shape and size of this curve, uh, this is shown here. So this is, um, there's a black hole at zero, zero. And then all the curves in different colors correspond to that critical curve that marks the, the size of the shadow. For black holes from a Schwarzschild black hole, so no uh, rotation, to a almost maximal uh, black hole, which is the red curve. So the blue curve is the Schwarzschild radius, is a Schwarzschild case. And the red curve is the uh, a very rapidly spinning black hole, seen at an inclination of 30, 30 degrees. That means uh, it's, it's almost polar. Okay? You, the, the spin of the black hole is pointing almost at you. Or uh, up to 60 degrees, that means uh, it's, it's close to a jump. Okay? As you can see, there, there are two things that happen. One is uh, once you get to, to high spins and uh, seen at high inclination, it's no longer a circle, it's kind of a D letter. It deforms on one side. By the way, it's not no longer centered on the black hole either. The, uh, it, because of the spin, there's a, there's a effect for uh, frame dragging that, that explains this effect. And uh, it gets smaller as the spin increases, but by, by a small amount. 
So that the, the formula for the shadow at two second order, for the size of the shadow is given by that. This formula, so the square root 27 j minus c squared is this 2.6 uh, that I was mentioning earlier. Uh, but there's a small correction here uh, that, that depends on the, um, on the spin of the black hole, but it's a second order correction, right? So uh, it, it, it's only a small effect, but it, the, the, the shadow does get smaller as the spin increases. So very silly question. Why do they call it a shadow? Shadow means you have something in front. There's a there's a light source yeah. behind. Yeah, it? exactly. It, but other people call it the silhouette. You know, okay. Um, but it's not a real shadow. Yeah. Well, it, it, it can be right. If if in most cases it's not because indeed uh, what produces the light is around the black hole. It's not in the back of. If if you put your shadow, it's, sorry, it's it's what stops light from the equation. This getting to us. So just to go back to that first slide that I had, so that explains in particular why black holes look, uh, you know, simulations of black holes, they look like this in, in the interstellar movie. In the, and and we, we all know what's happening is, so there, there's a this, this is really, if, if there was no GR here, there was no relativity, if it was Newtonian, you would have a disk, uh, a very uh, thin disk, almost perpendicular to the plane of the screen. But what you see is this, and what you so what you see is this because because the light ray here. Uh, so here the disk would be here, perpendicular here, right? But you see it because that light ray was curves back here. And you, you cross the disk in the back of the, of the black hole. So you see this part here, which is the, the back of the black hole seen because you, you see light rays that go like this. And you see the, the bottom back of the black hole at the bottom because it's the same. OK. Um, so now the question is, so that, that's one part of the story, right? One part of the story is there is this critical curve that, that separates two types of light rays. And so the light rays that are inside of the curve, they are shorter and they produce less emission. That's why we have a shadow. But in the images, we not only see the shadow, we see a ring from the shadow. So where is the ring coming from? So that's what I want to explain. You. So, uh, so this critical curve that separates the shadow from the outside of the shadow, is a, is a circle if it's a short shield black hole. If it's a black hole spin, it's a more complicated curve, although it can be approximated by the circle. And the question is, uh, what happens when we cross that, that curve? So what happens, by the way, just, just so it's, it's an interesting thing to think about, uh, in, in a short shield black hole, if you think of a photon that's right at the right angle, it will indeed stay in, in orbit, circular orbit, on the black hole forever, well, not forever, but it will stay there. If you have a chaos black hole, then uh, the, the photon will also stay in orbit around the black hole, but no longer on a circle. The, the symmetry is broken because of the spin of the black hole. And so this, this photon will describe these weird looking trajectories beads that look like these curves. curves. Uh, and it's going to be a different trajectory uh, depending where you hit, because of course, uh, again, in that case, that critical curve is not centered on the black hole. So you can hit the curve very much closer to the black hole if you're on that side and if you're on that side. So it's no longer a sphere, it's actually a shell. It has a certain thickness. Because if you hit the curve on that side, then this thing is going to stay in orbit with a fairly small radius. But if you hit here, it's going to stay in orbit with a much larger radius. So it depends where you hit the curve. So it's, it's, it's going to be a shell with certain thickness for um, uh, the photon shell, no longer a photon shell. So it's, it's kind of an interesting thing to think about. Is it possible to see our surface? Well, I know we're too far away, but if we were closer, could we see reflection? Of yeah. Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, you, you have, yeah. But, but the photons on that path, we don't see it because they're you're saying indefinitely going around. Well, okay, so but this this is a design, these are not unstable orbits, right? Ah, so okay. so that means that because, uh, it, you can see it very easily, in fact, that's what I was going to say now. So if you hit that curve just inside of the of the um, 
of the critical curve, then that light ray is going to end up in, in the black. If you hit the curve just outside of the, so this, we're not going to talk about this because they are lost, these photons are lost. If you hit the curve just outside of that critical curve, if you hit, well, if you hit just outside of the critical curve, then that photon is going to be maybe making a round or two, but it's going to eventually go out. So it, it, it seems unstable in the sense that if, you, if you're not exactly at the right value, but just inside or just outside, you, you don't go back to, to going back to the sphere, right? You, you just go one way or the other. Mm -hmm. okay. so, so, but so what we're going to, to discuss is what about those light rays that are just, that hit just outside of the of this sphere, okay? So there's an animation. Uh, so I should try to stop it. No, there's no way. Yeah, yeah, there is. Um, okay, so what we are going to look at now is uh, an animation that tries to demonstrate what's happening in that in that situation. Okay? So we're going to have a black hole here at the center with its certain uh, Schwarzschild radius. And we are going to suppose that there's a bath of photons around it that uh, come from the surrounding of the black hole, and we are going to look at what image we form. Okay? And we are arbitrarily going to separate the photons into different families. So we are going to look first at the photons that come from behind the black hole. It can be infinity, but it, in practice it's going to be the jet or the disk that's behind the black hole, and that are just uh, uh, bent less than 90 degrees, okay? So those are only slightly bent, okay? And these photons, we are going to call them the n equal to zero photons. So they, they do less than half a turn around the black hole, okay? So they come from anywhere. And they are going to form an image on the screen. So this is the screen that we are looking at. And this is the image that they are going to form, okay? So it's an image that, that that is fairly close to the real image of the material that's around the black hole, because the bending, the, the gravitational um, uh, lensing is not very strong for this one. Okay? So this is that image, n equal to zero. Now there's going to be more than this, sorry. So what it runs, if it runs. Yes, while it runs. So the, the next family of photons that we're going to consider are the photons that do half a turn. So they, they are bent by an angle between 90 and 180 degrees. Okay. So these are going to call the n equal one photons. So those are photons that come from the front of the black hole, between us and the black hole, and that do half a turn. So there's a bunch of them, and they produce another image of the black hole which is this image. And that image has to be has to be a ring, very narrow ring, because for the photons to exactly end up in that position of the screen, they have to come from exactly the right impact parameter so that they have done exactly half a turn. So they define a ring. It's a picture of what's between us and the black hole, but lensed by the black hole towards us after half a turn. So this is the n equal one ring, and it's much narrower, and it has a certain radius. Okay. In, in these images, uh, you are assuming that the emission comes from the disk of the, or, or it can be the light of the star. It could be, it could be anything. It's just yes. the path of photons around them. Yeah, but you are not assuming any no distribution of density, whatever. No, no, no. In the, so in this case, I think that they are in practice. Uh, they, they are assuming it's a disk. Uh, around the black. But in principle, all that I'm saying is, is true for any distribution. And, and in fact, I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Um, okay. So then we have the n equal two photons that are the photons that you guessed it make a complete turn around the black hole and are focused towards the screen. Now, once again, these uh, need to be to have exactly the right impact parameter. 
to, sorry, I, I stopped it late, too late. Then they need to have the exact right impact parameter to, to end up in that exact position of the screen. So again, it's a very narrow ring, and it's a ring that's a little bit smaller than the previous one, because, you know, the closer you are to the, to the black hole in projection, <coughs> the more turns you make, right? So the, the n equal two makes less, makes, has to be a little bit inside of the n equal one. Well, when you say a very narrow range of impact parameter, that's the outgoing. Yeah, that parameter, the incoming one, is yeah. always broader. Exactly. Otherwise, you wouldn't see anything. It's the entire region around the black hole. Yes, exactly. exactly. For, for all, all position around the black hole, there's, there are photons that will end up in that direction. Well, they must get within the surface. Yeah. I mean, they, they have to be, for any point two, they have to be behind the black hole to make a full turn. But, but any position uh, behind the black hole, there's going to be photons, if, if everything is isotropically, there's going to be photons that end up in the right, coming out in that direction. And so the final image that we see is the sum of all of these photon rings, all of these images, right? I mean, again, it, nature, of course, does not divide photons by n equals 0, 1, or 2, 3, no? But in practice, what this means is that the full image that we see is the sum of all of these other images. And of course, so the, the n equals zero is the closest to the truth, n equal one is a ring that's that's very focused, uh, dimmer, of course, n equal two is a bit smaller and again dimmer, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, and you get the whole sum and you get the image of the right. So what this means is because there are all these n equal one, two, three, four, five rings that are summed up, you are always going to be dominated by this ring, there's always going to be this ring in the image. And in fact, if you look at actual uh, GRMHD simulations of black holes, so those are simulations made with a certain black hole, with a certain spin, and a certain description of the plasma around the black hole, so those are typically disks around black holes. Uh, this is a Schwarzschild black hole with a zero uh, spin. This is a care black hole with a fairly large spin, but uh, where the disk is rotating in the opposite direction as the black hole. This is another black hole with uh, the same spin, but here the, the disk is rotating in the same direction as the, as the black hole. And, and well, you why are we so, so you said that you get distortion if it's if it's a spinning black hole, but they still look sick. Well, because they, here they use uh, an inclination, it's almost face on, right? Is it appropriate? This was done for M87. Okay. M87, the, the, it's only 20 degrees from being face. Uh, but so you can see that there's three images, even though you have three fairly different black holes. And in fact, this one, these two, sorry, are, are, are plasma models that are not very strongly magnetized, whereas this one is very strongly magnetized. You see very similar images. So this is good and bad. This is what I was uh, saying. It's good because on the one hand, if, if what you're interested in is confirming that you have a black hole and measuring the mass of the black hole, then that's very good, you, right? Because this, the size of this ray, of this feature of the ring, tells, tells you immediately what the mass of the black hole is. I mean, there's a small correction for the spin, but it, it gives you a very clear um, determination of the mass. So for M87, for instance, the two images that I showed at the beginning, the 2017 data, this was the size of the ring that was measured. 2018 data, this is the size of the ring that was measured. It's very similar, and that's what we expect. And Sajay Star, we see a very similar event. Why? Because we, we are dominated by the shadow and the ring. The shadow and the ring are universal features that are going to be there in all images of all black holes. Right. Uh, and so if, if that's what you want to confirm, that GR works and, and that you can measure masses of black holes from that technique, then this is very good news. But it's also very bad news because that means you can have a short black hole, the image. So these are three models, for instance, that were made, this is the same models I showed earlier, that were made to interpret the image of M87, the 2017 image of M87. And this is, so this is the full resolution um, simulation. This is the same simulation, but, uh, you know, um, 
simulated to, to reproduce what the HD would have seen with that simulation in actual data. Right? And you can see these three images are very, very similar. And they are very similar to the actual image observed for M87. Right? And yet, there are three very different situations. So Schwarzschild black hole, counter-rotating care black hole, rotating care black hole in the same direction as at the disk, very magnetized plasma, non-magnetized plasma, and you see three images that work just fine to explain the image of M87. Is, is the brightness asymmetry principally due to asymmetries of the disk, or is it due to the, the information? It's uh, the, the asymmetry, you mean that this is brighter than this? Yeah. It's due to Doppler boosting, basically. So it's yeah, the disk yeah. uh, So the, the disk here is approaching us, and here it's receding from us. So you have the negation of the emissions. Mm -hmm. right. Doppler boosting and Doppler yeah. boosting. Um, so, so what this means is, what can we say about black hole spin? Well, not much, right? Because it, it's a, only a small correction. It, it even, there are models where, some of these models, I don't know if these ones, but there are models where most of the emission comes from the jet rather than the disk, and they produce the same kind of image anyway, because what matters is there's a black hole there that produces the ring, it produces a shadow. Um, magnetic, sorry. Magnetic field strengths, well, uh, yeah. I don't know, because this is a non-magnetized or poorly magnetized plasma, this is a highly magnetized plasma, I can produce the... So, so the projected spin axis is horizontal, right? It's all, almost horizontal, yeah, pointing away from you. Yeah, because it's, that's, it's, that's not what my intuition told me. I'm used to seeing disks which you see an asymmetry because of, I don't know, maybe yeah. the transfer effect. So I was thinking the spin axis was vertical. But no, no, so, so this yeah. is the line of sight. Yeah. And the, the, that angle between the line of sight and the spin axis is uh, 170 degrees. Huh. And so it's only 20 degrees from pointing exactly away from you. And the material is rotating like yeah. this. But look, Laura, do this, the same mo models, they don't produce jets. I know that magnetically. Exactly. exactly. Produce, so, so you can separate things for Sadia star, it's same, perhaps. For M87, it's mad because well, it's producing a jet. Sadia star, we haven't published that yet. But for, for M87, it's definitely mad. I'm going to show you why. Okay. But you're right. I mean, uh, so this, even though, so but what I'm trying, precisely what I'm trying to say is if you want to do, for instance, accretion rates, there's, uh, what is it, three orders of magnitude uncertainty. Uh, three different, three orders of magnitude range can reproduce the images. But of course, the image is not the only thing we have about an x So we know, for instance, the power of the jet, right? So the power of the jet uh, discards the, the Schwarzschild radius. There's not, the, the, the amount of power you can extract from black hole is, is function of the, the spin. And it's like much more power if it's a spinning black hole and it's not. So, the, 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 these are immediately discovered. Well, we should discard them anyways because do we still believe they are Schwarzschild black holes? Aren't they all cursed? <laughs> for, for a supermassive black hole, it's a good question. I don't know. Before, for a stellar black hole, they all have spin because of conservation of momentum. But, but a supermassive black hole, material can be falling from many different directions. So it's probably could have a low value for the spin. Um, but but all I'm trying to say is that the image itself, and let me just say this, the image itself doesn't enable you to say much except there is a black hole. Mm -hmm. uh, ah, okay. So do, do the do the accretion disk has to be perpendicular to the spin of the black hole? Well, I don't know if they have but then, yeah, yeah, I think they, that, that's what they assume here anyway. But well they assume, but they did not necessarily I, that I don't the know. Case. maybe. I'm on deepest okay. ideas about this, but I think it's it's assumed that um, mm -hmm. it is done. Uh, yeah, because I mean, there would be any, any matter can can fall in any direction. So, but I know if, if yeah, you, but then you you you, you are yeah. a, a, well, there is an angular momentum for, for and exactly. You have to you know, so there has to be a disk. You don't have a spherical distribution of matter. Yeah, it has to fall through the disk. You can have ejections, yes, but stuff that's falling in is a part of the disk. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, if, if, if your okay, black hole exhausts the, the, the gas mass and then something else comes in later. Yeah, later you could have a, the disk exactly. change orientation. Yeah. All right, so what do we do? Well, we need polarimetry. That's what polarimetry uh, <clears throat> helps us with. So 
before right before you say that so so the EHT collaboration when the first m87 image came out they they made uh, you should say images here sixty thousand images so it was not sixty thousand different models it was just sixty thousand snapshot images of a variety of models exploring uh, spin uh, the mass is, is is set by the size but the spin uh, the description of the plasma the orientation etc sixty thousand models and many of these models like these three they were just fine they could reproduce the image of this. But then there's polarimetry. So all the EHD images, all the EHD data are taken in full polarization mode. It means we, we measure the four uh, or the two products for each telescope, uh, and we can make polarimetric images. So this is work that was started in this workshop in Bonn in 2019. And, um, and the end result of this was uh, this set of images that were published uh, in 2021, I think. So these are uh, even the same four dates that uh, M87 was observed in 2017. The gray scale in the back is just the um, high stocks image, the integrated radiation image. And these little thick marks here that are shown a little bit better as kind of pairs here, uh, they indicate the polarization vector. So that means the polarization of the electric field of the electromagnetic wave that reaches. And you can see that, uh, of course, polarization is only detected where there's signal. We worry which was not the case, but uh, they, they kind of uh, curl around uh, the, the center of the black. And so there are a number of ways uh, that we can analyze the, we can analyze this, but essentially it has to do with the direction of the magnetic field. So there are different post potential uh, geometries for the magnetic field. So here are three cases. For instance, this one is a toroidal magnetic field. That means the magnetic field is oriented uh, along the, the torus in the in that direction of the torus. And so the, the electric field is uh, comes out perpendicular to the magnetic field. We, we don't consider depolarization and parallel rotation of this here, but just uh, and, and so here the, the electric field would be observed to be radial, right? The, the, these polarization vectors would be radial. And then there's here one where the magnetic field is radial, uh, pointing, sticking out in that direction. And here one where it's vertical, so it's just... And so these kind of reproduce the, the observations that, that we observe. So we can sort of discard the idea that the magnetic field is following on. There are a number of ways that in the image you can quantify the magnetic field. So one is just a net, uh, um, Polarization in the image, uh, there's, you can calculate the mean polarization that's weighted by intensity. Turns out one of the um, most interesting way to do this is, is a sort of a, a moment uh, of the magnetic field defined in this way. Uh, so this is the polarization. Uh, and here the integration is over, uh, the, the M integration, the phi integration is over the azimuthal angle. And then rho is the radial direction. So this is uh, integrated over the azimuth angle. And you can define an infinity of these. Um, of course, it becomes harder and harder. But so if you calculate these, these uh, sort of um, quantitative measures of the magnetic field from the M87 images, this is, uh, you get certain values that are shown here as these bands in, uh, in blue, right? So here and here. And then in the background, you see different kind of models, the same 60,000 images that were made for the original analysis, uh, for colored by different, uh, so uh, the description of the plasma, MAD is very highly magnetized and saying it's not. Prograde and retrograde refers to the direction of the spin and the disk. And as you can see, for instance, uh, this this range here. Sorry, can you remind us the, the meaning of the acronyms of MAD and SAIN? Yeah, SAIN stands for standard and normal uh, evolution, and MAD is for magnetically arrested disk. So those are those those models. Uh, as we know, astronomers are very funny, right? So the, the first model was SAIN, so the second model 
But but in yeah no sorry but but in practice what this means is that these are very strong magnetic fields and uh, and saying are low magnetic. So in math models the magnetic field is so intense that it plays a dynamically important role. The, the particles follow the curve the lines of magnetic. So as you can see here, for instance. Uh, the, the, the range that's allowed for the linear for the average linear polarization kind of avoids systematically all the same models, right? The same models are precisely that's a flip in the third same models. And for the beta two, which is that turns out to be the uh, the, the most important uh, quantity, so beta two is the second moment that I showed earlier. But again, it, it kind of falls right in the deep of, of this. Uh, for the amplitude and for the phase, it, it kind of avoid all the same models, right? So the polarization tells us that the magnetic field is strong in, in around M87. I can't tell you about such a star, but around M87, the mad models are very much favored by the polarization. Yeah, that might be Next obvious. <laughs> We try, we try to be agnostic about this. <laughs> and, and the same happens just uh, late last year, there was a, a continuation of this work with circular polarization observations. And again, I mean, you, you, there's a very low level of circular polarization, and it coincides with uh, what is mostly predicted by the MAD models and not the same model. So, so all of this uh, favors um, the mad model, all of these failures, expression where the magnetic field is involved. And this has implication because like, then you have these 60,000 models initially. Only a certain fraction, but a large fraction could reproduce the images. But now of this large fraction, only a small subset can reproduce the parametric group. And so if you look at this final small subset, what kind of aggression rate, for instance, they have, and you find that this is a fairly narrow range, less than an order of magnitude uh, for the accretion rate on uh, M87, whereas before you had three orders of magnitude. Right? So by, by reducing the fraction of models that are allowed by the data using the parametric information, you can also um, restrict important parameters like the yeah. accretion um, Okay, so now just to finish this, uh, it turns out that black hole, uh, the, the accretion on black hole, of course, this is the material is moving at speeds close to the speed of light, so in particular, it's supersonic. Right? So you have a very turbulent medium. When material falls onto the black hole, it's a very turbulent medium. And so this is, for instance, a, uh, okay. this is a simulation that Andrew Chael made uh, of, of a disk around the black hole and uh, then ray tracing to produce the images that we would see. And you, as you can see, uh, uh, the image changes as a function of time. So what's the time scale of these changes? Well, the time scale uh, around the black hole or around anything, the dynamical time scale, you can define as sort of the size of the object divided by the, by the speed at which the material is moving. So for a black hole, the relevant size is the gravitational size, or it's about the, the Torchid radius, and the material is moving at the speed of light. So that time scale goes as this. Right? So that means, in particular, that's something that often people find uh, counterintuitive that more massive uh, black holes uh, have a much longer uh, time, uh, dynamic time scale. So they, they vary on a much longer time scale. So, so, in fact, this is just a dimensional analysis. If you put actual numbers, there's a factor of five here that comes out because it's G. Anyway, it doesn't. Um, so for an 87, this turns out to be two days. And for such a star, this turns out to be two minutes. So what this means is if you look at an 87, uh, you know, a few days in a row, you expect to see some changes, but not a lot, because it's only going to be a few dynamical times. Uh, for such a star, this is a big issue, and that's why it took us two years you know, longer to publish such a star than in '87. But that means that in a single night, such a star is changing like crazy. So we don't have a we don't have a steady source. It's a 
So as everybody who's done some uh, trying to reconstruct images from radio observations knows, if your source is not steady, that can be all kinds of artifacts. So Sajid Star is complicated. M87 is much easier for that reason. But so we expect things to move uh, on time scales of at least a few times this good. Right? So that means, for instance, during the observations of 2017, uh, which are shown here, 2017, there was five, uh, four days observed from April 5 to April 11. And uh, as you can see, sort of the first two days kind of look the same. The next two days are a little bit different. To be completely honest with you, we could never quite convince ourselves that they had actually changed or that there was not some kind of artifact in the data. But at least it's not inconsistent with uh, the time scale of uh, two days that we expect. But in 2018, so this is the 2018 image, there it is very clear that the, the brightness, they would, the members of the collaboration that runs all kinds of tests on this data to assess whether this was uh, significant or not. And they concluded that yes, it was highly significant that the, the, the peak of the asymptotal distribution was in a different angle from the 2017 data. And we expect this because precisely over one year, that's many, many different uh, um, dynamical time scales. So we do expect that the, the region uh, will be different. Uh, the region of the highest brightness will be different as, as is shown in, in this simulation. Um, now, before Will asks, what's happening here is there is uh, there is changes, but the material is still sort of going around in the same direction. So you expect the peak to always be kind of in that direction, but to wobble around because of the turbulence. Right? So this is exactly what we expect. Uh, we expect it to see, and we expect that once we have 2022 and 2023. Uh, this ring is going to be again like this, same size, because the size is defined by the mass. Uh, ring and everything because uh, it's a consequence of general relativity, but I am sorry. <laughs> yeah, but uh, that the, the region where the highest brightness is going to be is going to continue to go over there. So, so then if it goes upside down, that will be a problem. <laughs> if it starts to be uh, on top, for instance, yes, we have to be considered. Because the average angle only has to do with the inclination angle. And exactly, it has to do with the motion of the jet. And the thing. We don't expect that to change on time scale. That that's what, what is the fractional change in the total luminosity? Because it looks like it's right. The total luminosity is right. Uh, like I don't know, but it's of order 30% or something like this. I don't know the exact number, but yeah, it's not very different. Is the location of the minimum also uh, exactly uh, in the same fashion, or is there some difference because of No, that? no, it's exactly the same because the minimum is due to the fact that in that direction, so we assume that this is you know, circular representation. So in the direction of minimum, the material is moving away from us, it's not now busted, so we expect it to also move in the same fashion. Uh, I think that's it, yeah. So, sorry, with many observations, can you get some parameters of the turbulent flow? Well, that affects the magnetic field lines. I don't know. Do you know what I mean? The, the, um, the simulations, like the ones I showed earlier, they, ask, they, they use some recipe for the, for the turbulent. And I assume you could test whether the recipes were by comparing to different years. Yeah. So just, just to finish, this is my last slide, I think. So um, everything that I showed, by the way, uh, was based on one year and a little bit of data. So almost everything was 2017 observation. There was just this one 2018 observation that was published a month ago. We have observation in 2021, uh, 2022, 2023. We are planning 2024. Uh, so there's a lot more data. Uh, unfortunately, it seems that, so uh, I shouldn't say this because, but we are between us, you know? So uh, the, the 2017 data, the first M87 image based on 2017 observations, 
uh, the first 77 year was published in 2019, almost exactly two years after the observation. The 2018 image was published last month. So 19, 20, 20, 20, 20, six years. Uh, so we don't seem to be moving in the right direction in terms of getting the data out quickly. Uh, but nevertheless, we are thinking about the next project. <laughs> and the next project will be the next generation Event Horizon Telescope, which, if everything goes according to plan, should see first light somewhere at the end of this uh, decade. And the idea here is to add, so here the, the white symbols show uh, EHT uh, telescopes. Um, Active EHT telescopes and the blue symbol, the, the yellow symbols here are, are telescopes that are trying to participate. So, there, there's a couple of telescopes in, in uh, Korea, um, KVN uh, array that they would like to participate. And I think that, in fact, that was a what they call a drill three or so uh, a few weeks ago, and they, they did participate. Uh, there's a Yama telescope or Lama telescope uh, in, in the border between Brazil and Argentina. There's a telescope here in Tanzania uh, that is being uh, retrofitted. Um, so these telescopes, they, they might join the EHD in the next few years. But the NGEHD consists in adding all of these blue uh, telescopes that are shown here. And that the, the, the locations of which were chosen to try to optimize the coverture of what or the UV plane, so it means uh, try to, to make image fidelity as good as possible. And one of these telescopes is called SPM here. Um, I hope you can recognize the acronyms. It's some people not here, so it's a northern Maracay uh, phone. We, we hope that we get the telescope there. And if we do, uh, the other thing about the NGEHT is that it will observe at uh, 90 gigahertz, 230, and 345 gigahertz, three frequencies. And the idea was is to try to calibrate the phase. Uh, from the higher frequencies using the lower frequencies, so and then combine everything using the multi scale algorithm. So, this would increase enormously the cover to the UV plane. And the idea here is that we, we hope that we think we'll be able to not only see the, 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 the ring and the shadow, but also see the jet, the base of the jet, and answer the question of, of where and how are the jets okay, formed in this. So that's one of the main goals of this. The other goal being to make movies, uh, natural movies of these protocols, both in M87 and Sajay Star, because M87, we know we can do it, we just have to be patient. M87, it varies very quickly, so we can make a movie in one single night. But the problem is, we don't have enough sensitivity to show two minute scans to make a nice image out of just two minutes. So it varies, so it's a nuisance. It, it varies too fast. To be able to make good images, uh, but it's not bright enough that we can actually make a movie. But but with this telescope, we hope that we'll be able. To. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? We already got it. Have a question. So if I understand that one of the takeaway messages, then. The ring, the right ring in the image is not the accretion disk. Are photons coming from the accretion disk and other structures, right? But it's mostly the accretion disk. In oh. principle, it could be anything. In practice, it's mostly the accretion disk. But it, so it's, it's an image of the accretion disk, but... Directly. Uh, um, yeah, uh, be processed by gravitational lensing due to the black. Well, are they no more um, black holes you can observe? Well, not at that resolution at the moment. Uh, there, there's, there's about a dozen that are just outside of the range where we could, in principle, uh, see the ring. And we are monitoring them. The Sombrero Galaxy, for instance, in one. Um, but, and, and there's uncertainty. For instance, M87. Before the M87, the, the LTP observations, there were two measurements of the mass of the black hole. One was based on stellar dynamics, and one was based on gas dynamics. And they differed by a factor of two. So the, the correct one for 21st was the one based on stellar dynamics, which was six and a half uh, billion solar masses. 
If it had been the other one, which was only three solar, billion solar masses, the ring would have been twice smaller and we probably wouldn't have been able to resolve it. So, so these other uh, black holes that we think are just outside of the zone, maybe we're lucky and one of them is a bit more massive than we think. You, because, uh, are there any satellites um, radio? Uh, no, well, not for. There has been experiments. Um, uh, the LBI, two or three, maybe some somewhere here in uh, Germany. So I think it's two or three uh, that have put radio telescopes on satellites to do the LBI. One was a Japanese mission called, um, I don't know what it was called, and then more recently a Russian one. Um, that, that in fact the Russian one was interesting because it was a it was a very elongated orbit where Periastron was uh, just a few hundred kilometers above the Earth, but mm -hmm. Apastron was all the way to the moon. So it was very very elongated, so it gave a lot of different uh, baselines. Uh, but those were centimeter away then, and um, and the problem is you can't put a twenty meter dish on the satellite, right? So they were fairly small telescopes. And so sensitivity was very limited. But there's a project now that's being discussed of putting uh, maybe about six satellites in low and intermediate uh, Earth orbits, uh, equipped with with uh, telescopes to to uh, compare this. So if that happens, uh, that that would multiply the that would increase the sensitivity by a few. Maybe to five. It's it's complicated, not because uh, it's very it's very expensive and very complicated. Anything yeah. special is very expensive, but it's also complicated because there's a lot of. I mean, this generates about one petabyte of data every nine, and so downloading one petabyte of data from satellites is trivial. So that this is, I think, one of the main problems. Go ahead. I was wondering, uh, if for the first generation, uh, what if that one of the telescopes was not working, say the LMP? <laughs> Why should that one? <laughs> yeah, let's take another example. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so so the, the one telescope that uh, that if it's not working, we are screwed is uh, I don't know. Like ALMA is is, uh, is participating in these observations and it's participating as a phased array. What this means is, he, this I can explain everything about phasing. It, it serves up all the signal coherently, coherently of all the antennas, so the, the, about 50 antennas. So it's as if you had a 50 meter dish, perfect 50 meter dish. So ALMA, if you take away ALMA, we don't make it. So this is the one telescope that that, uh, that is really critical. Any other one you can remove. It's going to affect the images. There are simulations, in fact, that have been run where you remove one or the other. It, it affects the images. And they all, but they, and we are still in a regime where uh, you know the the uh, seventeen data, for instance, there were only eight telescopes. So if you remove any of them, it's uh, it's you know fifteen percent of you already, right? So. So they are all important, uh, but the only one that's really critical is ALMA. And it will be also for the next generation. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's good to have this kind of redundancy because even if it works, even if the, the telescope works, it could be raining. I mean, the, the weather could be bad. Upon, this is, in fact, scheduling is very complicated because you have telescopes all over. So, and there's almost a perfect anti-correlation between you know, the weather is good in uh, Chile and Hawaii. <laughs> Actually, last so, year it happened. We lost almost all the telescopes. I was in the center array of the DHT, and we were observing only with the two in Hawaii, SMA, DHT, and one in Arizona. So the triangle was almost a line. And yeah. yeah. So they're, they're all the weather. And then, but it's, 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 it's good to have on this. So you had questions, right? Okay, yeah. Oh, yeah, um, so how do you think go about uh, implementing the um, sort of uh, prerequisite that what you're actually observing in the components you're, you're receiving in the print uh, are coming from the jet or the disk? Because uh, when I first heard about uh, ray tracing, I uh, sort of uh, the first um, information I could find was uh, from Disney, 
uh, or say how they make their movies and how they sort of uh, make lighting look more um, realistic or something. And um, what they did, as far as I could tell, is that they kind of um, launched them, the rays, from the screen and worked it, they, their way well, back to the course. But um, here, uh, I'm wondering if you're uh, assuming certain the so I think you fix the geometry of the space around the black hole and uh, assuming it's it's uh, um watch I think it was and um so could you do that and sort of try to um only take the rays that don't go to infinity and don't get uh, up um swallowed up by a black hole and that ends up where you think the uh, jet or yeah. the that would be, or is it the other way around? It's the other, so ray tracing, the technique of ray tracing is exactly what you said. It consists of starting from the screen and going back to see where your your light ray goes. Right. So it's indeed it's very much used in in a video room where you 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 bounce around surfaces and you see where it goes. But the first I, I the first person who did use ray tracing was a, a Dutch or German painter called Durer. In, in many centuries ago. He actually made a, so he wanted to face a model, a live model, and he put a screen in front and, and uh, sort of a little, uh, like a straw, right? And looked uh, exactly for each position on, on the canvas, what he was seeing and just painted. Right? And it enabled him in particular to get the perspective right. So it's a very old technique. Right? Yes. The way that it's applied in, in these models is it's the other it's, it, you, you don't, I mean, you can make your model any way you like. You just make a model and you ray trace it. So you, the model is, in fact, independent of the ray tracing. Like you, you define your black hole, you put a, whatever you want around it, a cushion disk, a jet, whatever you want. In fact, you could put instead of a black hole, you could put some other kind of weapon, you know, a boson star or a strange star or a, a white hole or whatever. It, Whatever you like, and you just need to know what the the, the, um, the metric is, and then you reference your model. So then, after you can indeed, after the fact, we construct where you uh, the maximum of your emission came from. Right? If you you take this um, this thing, you know you 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 integrate this, right? So you can then play with this and see where the intensity is higher and which part of your light ray the intensity is highest and where your emission must become. But, but it's not that all the models, they have to be physically self-consistent. Right? So if you have an emission disk, you're going to have a jet. So you're never going to have just the emission disk or just the field. You're going to have all the emissions. Do we have any questions on zone? Okay, if not, we have time for one question. If somebody wants to, yeah. Hi, thank yeah, I'm wondering about the photon shell. Is it possible to consider this photon shell as a physical barrier that may affect the infinite particles? Because we have seen that several photons may be circling several orbits. So I am imagining like a barrier of light. It, it's not actually, no, it's not. It, because, um, so, in fact, this is uh, Carlos recently asked me this question. Um, if a photon were born here inside of the photon shell, but had a, a momentum in that direction, it would be able to escape. It's not like the it's not like the horizon. It's not like the Schwarzschild radius where if you're inside, you, you're never going to be able to escape. Here, you can escape a photon. That, that's produced between the Schwarzschild radius and the photon sh uh, shell can escape if it's pointed outwards. It's just those mm -hmm. photons that, that will come out in that direction, those come. They will. So it's, a, it's not a physical barrier. It's just a, it's just a, the image. Yeah, it's just a, a specific region where photons with that, um, uh, What's it called? The, the impact parameter will stay in, in circular. But there's something fascinating about this is some people are looking at this, this idea that this is somehow a hologram. 
right? Because every every point on if you, if you take a Schwarzschild radius, as I said earlier, every point on the critical curve. So the critical curve is a two D curve, right? On the plane of the sky. So, but every point on the on the critical curve, if you send a photon at that right exactly right uh, impact parameter, it's going to describe a certain trajectory, complicated trajectory around the black hole. And that trajectory is a 3D structure. So every point along the, the photon, uh, the critical curve, is connected to, to a 3D curve itself at a different, with different properties. So it kind of, it's kind of this idea of a hologram where you, you see more than one dimension in, you have an extra dimension. So it's a fascinating kind of structure. Okay, let's uh, thank Laurent again.